Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so this Hello. is um, this is an interesting bunch of people, and this is a Not Twiddlers number twenty-five or this is one one zero zero one in binary or <laughs> nineteen in hex. <laughs> I thought I'd, be, I, I'd I'd give it a flashing start with all these. Uh, Chrome programming people uh, who are joining us tonight. Um, <laughs> Olivia Jack, the maker of um, the Hydra platform. Richard, of course, the advanced modular synth programmer and sound engineer, uh, sound designer, and William Fields, uh, designer or the creator of Fields OS. And we'll cover all of that stuff. Um, it's good to have you guys here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be it's back. great to be here and meet you all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was thinking, you know, um, I'm not a programmer, uh, and um, I do like to um, to use instruments which were conveniently designed to uh, to for me, you know, to to play around with. But um, you all have in common that you are both uh, designers of your um, environments or uh, programs, and also. Um, are really amazing in, in having amazing output with that. You know, usually you are either a really good programmer or a really good artist, but um, you hardly find people who are really good in both, I guess. I mean, that, that's you, that's what I usually find. And I, I'll, I'll put myself in the category of the, the bad programmer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I dabble in it, you know, with just um, sort of uh, modifying things but coming up with an entire environment or system is um i think it's pretty unique so um yeah maybe uh you i think olivia and william both um both have designed their own platforms maybe you can explain to people what motivated you to design your instrument or your platform and um how it works maybe olivia yeah i guess start, start, start um, with so Hydra, I think, is sort of the biggest thing that I've made that other people use and that I also um, perform with. And I think, but I also sort of have a lot of experiments that I just put online and then sometimes other people use them and sometimes they don't. Um, but uh, with Hydra, I was really, I had been experimenting a lot with programming um, live using this protocol called WebRTC online that lets you send lots of video and audio from one computer on the client side to another computer on the client side without having to pass it through a server. And um, I was also giving coding workshops and I wanted the people in my coding workshops to be able to experiment with this passing live streams between each other in a low, friction way, I guess. So I started actually just making a library to make it easy to mix um, just video live streams together. Um, and that took a lot of inspiration from how modular synthesizers work and um, just kind of the idea that you have a source or multiple sources and um, can combine them together and the way that you route different things together is how you end up with an output. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but um, basically, yeah, just the idea of thinking of each function of code as a, a module that can be rearranged in different order, in a different order. Um, and so the way you use Hydra is by writing code directly into the browser and it lets you um, mix different things together. And it turned out once other people started using it, they immediately started doing really like, to me, kind of exciting things with it. Um, but I never intended this to be something that would become a library or would become something that lots of people would use or, um, and, but it kind of turns out that making something that was easy for myself to play around with something I was interested in playing around with is also easy for other people to play around with it and it, also was good to do live in front of other people. Um, and so then I started um, getting invited to do live visuals with the system that I, that I had made. But um, a little bit related to one thing you were saying is I do find the process of like building tools for myself can often be really 
separate from this creative process of experimenting with them. And sometimes I almost have to like, like my creative experiment process, I can only do at night when I'm kind of like in bed in a different or like in a different space. And then my I'm building a tool process, I have to do it in a different space, even though it's with my computer or something. So the, yeah, the, the designing of, of, of um, your uh, tool, um, is it uh, something you you kind of allocate time to? Or is it like you're, you're sort of playing around with it and you think, ah, oh, I might actually need something um, to work differently and then you modify your, to your tool on the go? Or is it, are you, is it two separate processes in your mind or is it sort of one thing? Um, I think they're two separate processes that feed into each other. But I still, I think because I'm new to viewing myself as a live performer, sometimes I don't take that piece as seriously with myself, even though it's actually one of the main things I spent the last year doing. But I, I take myself more seriously as a programmer. So when I'm like, I'm going to sit down and do something, um, I program a system and then um when i'm getting ready getting ready for like a performance or something um i'm like in a different headspace mm. if that makes any sense yeah sure yeah yeah that's how how it works i i think in, in most people's minds you know there are two totally different mindsets two different processes you know um I mean, um, if I look at my own experience, you know, if, if I use with if, if I use modular synths, you know, designing, thinking of a patch or thinking of a system that is going to work as a certain signal flow or it's going to work in a certain way is a different thing than uh, actually performing on it and see what it actually does. You know, I mean, you can, uh, yeah, you, it can sort of bleed into each other. But it, yeah, I, I have to start with a starting point somewhere, you know, like uh, what if I do this and what if I do that and then first think of a sort of signal flow and then at some point you start playing around with it and you see what else is needed. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of think of it as like two completely separate things. There was like when I'm working on the system, I use like one part of my brain, but when I'm actually performing and like, pl like playing on the system, I, I really have to turn off that part of my brain. You know, it's more intuitive and almost like bodily you know, where I, I'd let my hands, I kind of try to get out of my own way and let my hands do what it needs to do. Um, whereas when I'm working on the system, it's it's more like intellectual, you know, it's more like higher brain kind of stuff where I'm like trying to be very precise about what I want to do. And, and, and um, but when I'm actually playing on the system, it's, it's totally different, you know. It's like I think it's good to keep the. I think I heard Square Pusher talk about that once too, where it's like you have to. It's best to keep those two things separate, yeah. You know, those two aspects. Yeah, you know. keep the programming for admin days and the uh, and the creative, <laughs> creative part for um, you know performing days basically, or you know, uh, for jams and stuff like that. So so William, can you can you tell? Uh, people uh, kind of the short story of what um, your your instrument or your uh, it's not really a platform right because it's only available to you so far right uh, what is what is yeah story? yeah I haven't been able to uh, I, I'd like to open it up but um, I haven't really been able to or I haven't had the time to, to work on it yet but um, yeah basically I used to make music kind of in a traditional way on a doll, you know, like with a piano roll and placing each note and, um, you know, taking forever on a single track and, you know, working on it and working on it till I was sick of it, you know, <laughs> and didn't want to hear it anymore. Um, it would take a lot of time to finish a track. Um, but then um, at some point, basically I had kids and I didn't have so much free time anymore. Uh, but I still, you know, I, was, I had, I have to make music. It's, it's part of me. I have to do it. So I had to find a way. So um, basically I started to improvise with a friend of mine and it started out where, and, and he's a singer and um, a piano player and 
an amazing musician, like where just music just flows out of him. Uh, really in incredible guy. Uh, Jeremy Beck is his name. Um, but at first I would just put him through effects, you know, on my computer, I have the different VST plugins and stuff like that. And I would just run him through effects and I'd have a knob box, a MIDI controller where I would, you know, tweak the effects in real time and we'd improvise. And that just slowly evolved over time until I started adding more and more features to it. At some point I added like a kind of a step sequencer thing to it. Um, I'm using lemur as a controller. Um, so I just kind of slowly evolved the, the user interface and added more and more features. So it became more and more powerful um, until eventually it was a full fledged live performance system basically um, that I could, I could perform with solo as well uh, because it had, you know, bass and drums and synth and that, you know, everything that I needed. Um, so it really started out like that as a, you know, as a way to be able to still make music when I don't have a lot of time, because we would just get together and and jam basically and record the whole thing. And, you know, the next day we'd have like a whole album's worth of new music to listen to, you know, <laughs> which was great. It was very like fast and, and rewarding to do it that way. Um, so, you know, basically we would we would jam and record it and I'd listen to it. I would take notes about you know, what I wanted to improve or change or features that I wanted to add. And you know, then I would go back and work on the system and, you know, make those changes or tweak this or that. Uh, and then we'd have another session and repeat over and over again. You know, we'd practice, you know, once a week or once every other, every two weeks. And I just did that for years, basically, and just iterating, iterating over and over again and, and making you know, these small changes and improvements until eventually it became a pretty, you know, powerful system. And I, 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 I really, um, I'm a big advocate for that approach, you know, of like making just, you know, just making something and then listening to it, taking notes and then iterating on it, do it again and again and again. And, you know, just over time, you know, over a period of years, you end up with something that's, you know, really powerful and that's, that's really your own thing you know that you've developed so so, yeah. so you use um lemur as a, the input device but what is actually running the sound then um the sound is running in uh reaper okay that's the the doll that i that i use um and i you know it's just the way it ended up like today i think if i were to to start again i would do something like bitwig or um or maybe even Max MSP or something like that, um, I think. But just historically, that's the way it worked out. Um, you know, I don't do, I don't write any like DSP code or anything like that or audio processing. I just use other people's plugins and, and things like that. That's kind of where I draw the line. Like I, the code that I write is more about control um, and, and MIDI, MIDI data, control data, you know, sequences and stuff like that. But it's all it's all running in Reaper, and there's like this JavaScript layer in between that handles kind of generative stuff, which I could talk about later. But mm. yeah. So, so um, right now it's well, um, I mean it goes into Reaper, but is there some uh, sort certain synth or something that generates the sound? Because um, I hear like a, when I listen to your music, I hear like a very um, sort of uh, it sounds like it's a very small palette, but yeah. the variations are insane. They are enormous. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so. yeah, I mean that that's sort of my goal is yeah, like to have a a system that's as expressive as possible. Mm. You know, within that, that's also intuitive and controllable. Um, so yeah, it's I'm not using any kind of um, anything special really. I, I use. Uh, they're all soft synths and, and software samplers running inside of Reaper. I actually use um, the guy, one of the guys that founded Bitwig used to have a company called uh, Vember Audio. I think he's Swedish or something. Um, and he, they, they had a, a software synth and a software sampler. The synth is called Surge and the sampler is called Short Circuit. 
Um, and Surge has recently become open source and they're still developing it. It's free and, and it's great. Um, and that those are the two real sound sources that I use are, are just this, this really old software sampler and, and the synth. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, Richard, you were the one who, who um, tipped me off on uh, on uh, Williams Music. You kind of discovered it for me. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, William. I've been a big fan since Field of West came out. Um, yeah, I was in, just fascinated with the whole process, or even just even the whole concept of that album. You know, you generated all those tracks was just really fascinating to me is like an idea and also from the exec all the way from the execution all the way to the output every genre of one of those tracks was just real to me it was um yeah fascinating it really what it, it made me want to explore building my own systems and kind of diving back into the computer realm out of the hardware realm which i've been living in for like the past eight years uh, making records with hardware and modulars and stuff like that, but but I, it's funny because I <laughs> I do these things where I go in full circles, you know, where I like start at one point, then I get into something, and then I kind of get burned out on that, and then I'll go back into something else. And because my first few records were um, a lot of them were created completely in the computer, first few records using Max MSP, Super Collider. Um, a lot of early stuff that was, in, you know, like OS 9.2. I'm sure Yoakum remembers the old, old OS 9.2 days or uh, yeah. early er, early OS, Mac OS. But there was a lot of really cool apps. And some of the first introductions to coding uh, for me was like Super Collider, Super Collider 1.0. And uh, I made a lot of really cool stuff back in the day on that. And like my Aaliyah map album, a couple of my other records, I used, the, used some of that heavily. And it was, you know, just like, 30 or 40 lines of code and you had a whole you know operator library of different objects you could call up and create these really complex things with just a couple of you know like a couple lines of code which was really interesting to me at the time um and i was also experimenting with c sound quite a bit um and and uh, composer's desktop project i don't know mm. if you guys have played around with that but cdp you know, yeah that one because um, I was a big Trevor Wishart fan. I loved his mm. music. I still do and was curious about his process and then I discovered his tool set, which you guys can actually download for free now. It used to be something that you had to pay for. I, I was buying it back in the day, like I was buying Super Collider before it went public. But yeah, now all these tools are free and open source and you can play around with them and check them out. But S Composer's Desktop Project really blew me away. Yeah. Um, Super Back radical. then, it took it took like a whole night to do one one process. Though <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah. I remember, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of you know putting in the the numbers in the parameters and then just go to bed and it, listen in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, ah, no, not to, you know, I have to do it all over again. <laughs> yeah, but there was so many. I had I had all these documents of all these like lines of DOS code of you know different values of like all these sweet spots that I found, and then I would just like enter in different values and find all the sweet spots and paste them in into the DOS window. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm one of those people who's kind of jumped around in various different platforms. And now I'm actually, um, I think you, you mentioned this before, Yoakum, you had my friend Ben Deru, um, and uh, you guys did an episode on title cycles. I've been experimenting with title cycles quite a yeah. bit. I've got title cycles running with Super Collider again, <laughs> using Super Dirt and, um, um, Jack Router, so I'm doing all the video IO stuff and audio stuff through Super Collider. Um, and now I'm using the ES9 Expert Sleeper, so I'm using Tidal Cycles to control um, MIDI to CV and gate data to my modular. So I'm <laughs> doing live coding, but at the back end, getting all the crazy sort of organic control voltageness of modular. So I'm trying That's to amazing. merge the two. Worlds yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Last time you were you were on about how you were uh, planning to merge the two, but so so you know you got it running. Are you are you uh, happy happy with? I've the got results? it running are now. You? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, some nice. crazy stuff is. <laughs> title cycles can do some pretty wild things, and that's what I love about 
um, this live coding thing is you can get into like dangerous territory really quickly <laughs> where you could do these things that are like that feel like they're wrong. You're like, oh my god, I'm running this sequence at six thousand BPMs. Like, <laughs> like just and I love just doing stupid stuff like that just to see what what happened, you know. And I like I I love doing things I where I feel like oh wait. This mm. is, I might be breaking something. Um, I shouldn't and, be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You get this feeling like you shouldn't, you know, be doing this. And that happens a lot with modular. You know, there's no rules or there's nothing telling you, hey, you can't do this. It's a completely open system. And, you know, you when you build a system yourself. Oop. What you is didn't... going to live in that environment? Uh, you know, what... Oh, what's up? Did we just cut out or? No, you dropped out for just a second. Um, so I, I, I thought you didn't pay your bill, but <laughs> <laughs> you're fine now. Yeah, exactly. 6,000 BPM. But yeah, that's what I've been really, I've been having a lot of fun with Tidal Cycles just because you, it's, it's almost kind of has that same exploration approach to modular. You can just basically you start at a tempo and then it starts running and then you decide what you want to do from there. You can um, speed up, ramp down or degrade things, or you can do nested things within bigger things. So you have these, you know, and for me, it's just kind of evaluating through different lines in real time to kind of do these different things I want to have happen um, in the piece. That's kind of where I'm at right now. I know other people that, that work with, with title cycles, they'll just have one, Bit of code and they just let it run through the whole thing. I know Mike kind of does his stuff like that, but me, I'm just to the point where I've like find cool sweet spots that I like, and then I just I'll let I'll just evaluate that code, um, and and then let that run, and then I might have things that happen and tweak on. Then I'm doing some other stuff on the modular that's done by hand, so it's kind of a it's a bit of both worlds: tweaking, executing, tweaking, executing back and forth, and it's been this really fun process i haven't really released any of the new music that i've been doing that's been working in this way but i've been finding a lot of really cool interesting combinations where i'm having title cycles sending out clock data to some of my eurorack sequencers so they're in time with title cycles but then i might malt or divide from that and then if stuff changes or goes into these other words you get all these like overlapping strange you know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, you know, these strange <laughs> rhythms that happen. And I'm getting into some really bizarre stuff lately, which I can't wait to <laughs> to release. Uh. I might scare people away. I don't know. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, just having a bit of fun with it right now. But it, I think it's a really fun um, uh, mixture to try. At least I wanted to try it. I know there's a couple of people on the Title Cycles forum that are also experimenting with this idea so i'm not the first person to do it i'm merely just checking it out <laughs> and seeing what could happen um but there's there's definitely something fun there's definitely interesting things that can happen um with this do you, do you feel the 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 translation from title to modular do, do you feel it can it can keep up with with the resolution of things or do you find it you, you lose some things along the conversion well, how, how, what is the the protocol is it just midi uh most of it's midi midi time code oh, okay. so, and then some right. of it's just audio rate cb gate stuff too you can do because ah, okay. uh, it's dc coupled and it's 16 outputs on the uh, on the expert sleeper so you can freely assign any one of those outputs to be whatever you want. It's all software based from okay. the routing from the software itself. So, um, yeah, you could do extremely precise stuff with it if you want. Um, it just depends on however you want to set it up. But uh, yeah, I've been doing some pretty. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. When I, I I like this combination of. I'm not a live coder, but I think the combination of live coding with like manual, like knob tweaking and stuff like that is really powerful. I think, I mean, I, I, I saw Olivia do that at, um, at the Algorithmic Arts Assembly in, in San Francisco, where I think you were like live coding the visuals, but you also had a knob controller where you would like tweak things. I think that's that's really powerful because then you have kind of both sides of your the brain going right you have like the 
the the coding side, but also the kind of intuitive, the like physical side. I, I think that's a good combination. Yeah, I I really like to. I have just one MIDI controller, but I live code what the MIDI controller, um, like a, with a knob controller, that I um, then live code what it corresponds to. But I also I really um, like having this gestural control of a lot of things. So I often also use a camera, just not as the actual image of the camera, but just to kind of. Like when I want to add movement to something, I like add, I use the amount of light in the image to control the Im the amount of movement in the image or something like this. So then I just like, when I want to kind of add some more human feeling to something, I'm coding and then I, and also I use feedback with the screen a lot. So it ends up being how I move the mouse and the cursor also affects mm. the image and it feels like a sort of gesture or something. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to go back to title cycles because it, um, it, I think the way the language is designed, um, which is you sort of start with a base pattern and you're transforming that pattern, to me, um, it, it relates a lot to also m modular things and this idea of like you have a signal and you're transforming the signal and the way you chain these things together builds up to what you're um, creating, which is also really different than a lot of programming languages that are more like you have to have a class and create variables and then change those variables and and to me those kinds of languages are harder to like kind of just mess around with um and so in in making hydra it, it's kind of really similar conceptually to title except instead of patterns in time it's patterns in space and time Yeah, I actually, um, um, coming back to your um, field OS, William, um, I think we were discussing before the show, you call it a generative environment, but um, I mean, I, I checked out the way the video where you made sort of this presentation or explained the, the instrument, mm, uh, yeah. but l largely to me, it's, it looks like a performance instrument. I mean, there's some generative things you can do with it you know sort of like make starting points and stuff like that um but you know the interaction with it you sort of makes uh makes the the music you know your your performance yeah yeah i mean as as i explained it, it started out as this kind of live performance improvisational system yeah um and it, it kind of evolved from there into a generative system because essentially what happened is um you know, you know, Lemur has a scripting language inside of it um, that it's pretty, it's kind of annoying to use uh, and somewhat limited, but um, you can kind of script uh, within Lemur and set values and stuff like that. So what I did is I realized that I could create a button that would randomize all the controls. So basically I, love I, have, I love those buttons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, because I, you know, I kind of refined the system over time, where each control was uh, like a meaningful, simple control. Like for example, I, for reverb, I only have one knob, mm -hmm. and it, it it controls both the 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 depth or the wet dry of the the reverb, and also the the size of the room. So it's like I I, I just have like one control. I can just quickly set it. Um, so so let me ask as, ask you this because um um you know you know a lot of synths and some soft synths have these randomized buttons but what i always find is um um there should be a range you can set for it to randomize you know yeah. because otherwise you end up with like uh if you if you reverb for example can go for an hour you'll always have yeah. like uh, 15 mi 59 minutes plus you know what i mean yeah and yeah. uh <laughs> or you know you're you're always in the in a sort of extreme domain so have you sort of built in things that keep it in under control in some in some way or in sort of sensible parameter ranges yeah yeah exactly so it started yeah. out just pure random and i found that most of the time it just it sounded like crap you know it wasn't good <laughs> <laughs> so over time i i kind of would tune the randomness make some things less likely to happen some things more likely to happen um 
you know, so like reverb, for example, I, I tend to like stuff dry, like pretty dry. So I would I'd program it so that the random values tend to be quite small. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, I, I work with values between zero and one, I got a floating point value. So it's really easy to make things uh, random values tend to be smaller or larger just by taking it to like, like if you take a number between zero, a random number between zero and one and square it, it's going to tend to be a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take a random number between zero and one and take it to the one half power, it'll tend to be a larger number. So things like that, I would kind of uh, create um, tendencies or tune the randomness so that certain things are less likely, certain things are more likely. And just to, to kind of match my preferences. Um, and then at some point I started to make separate, uh, like multiple randomization buttons that are tuned in different ways. And that's kind of how it ended. I ended up creating Fields OS, the, the radio show, and these 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 different uh, kind of genre buttons, so to speak. Like where I would I'd have like a techno button that would you know always have like a, a kick drum, you know, four four kick drum kind of thing, and um, and it would tend to have certain settings. Um, and so I, I could create these different buttons that, that tuned the randomness in different ways to, to create these kind of different genres. Um, and that's kind of how it, I ended up doing this this uh, Fields OS radio show thing. So so the, the stuff on the Fields OS album is actually, um, it is actually rent, uh, uh, sort of uh, generative then. So, so there, those yeah. were not performances. They, those were basically no. you choosing um you know a genre or something and then just you went with the one you liked the most and that was your genre recording basically is that how it how do you right yeah i mean i would i would press record and let it run for an hour um mm. and sometimes i'd have to do it a couple times if there was like a real stinker like <laughs> at the beginning or something because occasionally you'd get like you know really high pitched like annoying things you know i, I didn't edit or curate really um, but if there was something that was really bad, I would I would start it over again. But you know, sometimes there's stuff that's really not so good in the middle of it, and you know, it, so it became kind of a an exercise in acceptance of the mm. you know whatever the however the dice rolls. You know, um, I just kind of tried to go with it. Um, so yeah, they're not they're not curated. It's just running by itself. Um, whatever came out came out. Yeah. 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 Nice. So okay, so yeah, so the system basically allows you to either do that or to use such a, a setting as a starting point and then sort of perform. Uh, yeah, exactly. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because some of my stuff is like the traction release is like is most of the music I make is me actually performing with it on the on the you know on the lemur and I'm actually controlling things. Um, but what I do is I kind of I generate I, I use my rant, the generative stuff to. I generate these seeds. And I kind of collect. I can save the ones that I like. Um, it's kind of like a slot machine. I can just keep hitting the button. It'll keep, <laughs> me, it'll keep giving me more and more stuff. And the stuff that I like, I'll save it. And then I'll come back later and recall those and perform with them. And and then the ones, the performances that turn out really well end up being like what I release, basically. Yeah. Most of the stuff, you know, 90% of it gets thrown away. But the, the good ones... Uh, you know, we'll get really I think that's true for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Ninety percent of the percent of the stuff that I do it gets binned, you know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Cool. So um, yeah, I mean, let's see if there's uh, anybody in the comments. Yeah, I, I should do this housekeeping thing. People who are watching this on uh, YouTube or Twitch, they can comment in the comment section, and then once every while, when uh, there's a fitting comment or question uh sander who's in the background will uh, kind of slide it in and we can uh, we can discuss it um this is a question from i don't know kci or whatever um is there anything you find particularly awkward um to do in tidal cycles or super collider um in other words any ways to improve i'm not sure if i understand the question um any of you have one have a go at this? 
I mean, I'm I'm pretty still early on in my journey with tidal cycles, but you know, stuff that, like I said before, you just have to realize that once you start running it, it's running. <laughs> so that concept for a lot of people, it's it's very similar to modular, like, um, you know, the sequence is always running. It's not like you're on a timeline and you can just stop something and then work on that section. You have to think about things in a completely different mindset. Um, which, you know, I bring a lot of friends over here that when they come to my modular system and then they, they, they used to work in a DAW where, you know, you, you have a, you have a timeline, you can, you can predict how certain events and things will happen with automation and, you know, with programming, uh, in a piano roll editor or whatnot, but that's not necessarily the case in working in an environment like title cycles, you, you have to think of things as these cycles of time that are running and then you can interrupt those functions or, you know, or with, you know, different values of code or whatnot. So you have to, you have to, you have to go into it with a different mindset. Um, but you could do things that are much different that, that, I don't know how to explain it without like showing it, but it's, uh, you can do things that go far out of working in like a linear fashion and, and get results that, 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 would be very difficult to do on a linear, but in a linear based sequencing environment. Um, so I guess it's just the way that you have to think about it. Some people don't like working that way. I've showed my friends some of my title cycle stuff and they're just like, yeah, that's just too, you know, how do you plan for some other thing to happen in the track? You know, well, it's like you have to write a separate line of code if you want that to happen and you execute it for that to happen in that point in the track. So you have to think about things differently. But um, And for some people, they don't want to approach making music like that. And I can understand that. That might be awkward. Because so, so is it actually the process you are, you are taking, you are using, like uh, uh, the stuff you are doing with Tidal Cycles? Because there are so many ways to to stitch it together afterwards, you know. And I mean, if if you if you get yeah. something really in amazing and you want to jump to a next section, you know, you can sort of scratch your head, read the manual, and try to come up with something new, or you can just try something, just throw it in there, see what happens. But um, you can just also, you know, Lego it together afterwards. I guess is that is yeah. that something you do? I mean, there's nothing against there's, that. I there's guess. no right or wrong way. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm, yeah. I'm purely exploring these tools just from just to see what happens and mm -hmm. um, there's no, you know, some stuff is really cool. Then there's been some stuff like William said that, you know, sometimes you try some stuff and you get so much stuff happening, you, you get into some stuff that's not so great. <laughs> it's a not so great territory and that, that happens a lot. I mean, that happens with the modular too. You know, you can get this really big patch going and spend a few hours and then all of a sudden you start making something that sounds really bad, but then you have to kind of <laughs> retrace back and figure out what's causing the bad stuff to happen, but um, and then sometimes you just go with it. You know, it's like, oh well, whatever. I've gotten this far. Just work on what happens. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I guess you know, I I, I mean, I'm all over the place. I mean, I play a lot of with uh, with Max MSP. Max, uh, I play a lot around with Ableton. I also, um, when I was working over at Google, uh, met Doug Eck there when he's working on the Magenta project and they've been working with AI machine learning based tools and they've actually released some free um, uh, Max for Live objects that you can download off their website to play around with sort of generative instruments and so I've been experimenting with that too and you know machine learning as it applies to sound design um, there's all these different really interesting areas all of this can creep into Besides just music composition, even the last project I finished with Yamaha for their montage synthesizer uses this new small technology where it uses a machine learning engine to learn your patches and it will compute 1,024 different variations based on, say, like you pick FM patches of your favorite mm -hmm. ones. It could be like a bell, a bell sound, a bass sound, uh, and maybe some non-musical sound that doesn't have anything... Uh, musical in it, and then it will triangulate all these different patches into a touchscreen region screen that you can touch, and you see these different color regions of all the different mapped out um, variations of each of those patches, and then they can blend into each other. So you can take a there's like a trajectory map, and you can move this this 
this line, uh, trajectory line that can be automated too with LFOs or a knob or whatever you want to assign. You get multiple different paths as well. So they group over to e into each other. Um, so you could hear all these different variations that the machine learning algorithm created for you. And since it's all made with FM synthesis, it, it makes uh, finding all these really interesting sweet spots. You know, you can just, so, it, rather than spending hours of time programming, it, it, yeah, it generates so, all this stuff for you really quickly. Yeah, and then and then you can of course repeat the process. So choose one that you like and have it sort of sort of hone in. And yeah, then so you can hone in. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing. That's yeah. that's what yeah. I've been doing a lot. Yeah. So mm. I I think this is one of the the big values of uh, kind of generative systems is that you're it helps you to explore this. I think of it as like a possibility space, right? It's kind of like a multi dimensional possibility space. And typically, like we have habit, we're humans, we have certain habits and ways of doing things that we fall into these ruts. But um, when you work with a generative system, it, it helps you to break out of that. And you, you can find these like coordinates within this possibility space that you would never really find on your own. You know, it's a, I, I think it's a really powerful kind of boost to, to your creativity, you know, and help yeah, you, know, I mean, you, you never you, make, yeah. There's there is uh, some um, uh, often heard criticism, like you know, um, using generative systems is basically making the computer or the system do the work for you. But I, I don't know how you think about it, but I I always think eventually it's it's a it's a case of judgment. You know, you'll yeah. you're you're still the the person or the yeah the the curator or whatever who makes the decision. Um, because it, in theory, you you could have anything, you know, generate millions of variations of things. But you, as an artist, you were the one choosing where to stop, you know, where where to what to go with, basically. So. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's more like stumbling up, stumbling upon things rather than actually writing things out. But it's as valid as a, a, a form of creation, I guess. Um, yeah, I, th I think the. the Go ahead. Yeah, oh, right. oh, yeah, just to me, it's a lot about um, creating systems that let us be creative in different ways or as humans be creative in different ways. And all of these, I think all software are just kind of human ideas and thought processes and stuff. And often when machine learning gets abstracted to be this sort of when people try to apply it to universal things of like we're going to make a computer musician that's completely by itself or something is where I don't really believe in it because um, I don't think you can abstract any universal thing in this way where a computer can do it. And so that's why the whole even sometimes people it's people there are these headlines like are robots going to replace musicians and um, and to me, it's like, uh, I just, it seems like people writing these things haven't that, spent that much time with either making music or machine learning systems or something. Um, and to me, a lot of this is, is just really about um, creating systems that let us be creative in film. You got a question, Olivia. <laughs> Hydrax seems quite out there in terms of not having much in the way of peer software. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think there is a lot of peer software, like, for example, vSynth, that's a Max MSP library for visuals is like, um, maybe similar in this way um, of kind of trying to have a software approximation of analog video synthesis. But um, I guess it is also just really inspired by a lot of different kind of random ideas I have. And then I, it keep the project keeps growing in different ways or I like make a drawing interface or add weird pixels to control sound or things like this. So um, maybe that's why it's not like other software because it's just like my own train of thought. But I think it's also, um, I think there's so many different ways of making software. And I feel like um, the things that end up becoming products are so limited in what they are. And so I really appreciate kind of like art toys or just small bits of software that do something in a really different way. 
So, so is Hydra open source, or are you the only sort of contributor to the system? It is open source, um, meaning that people can see the source code and copy it and change it. But um, in terms of working on the core, at first I had this idea of like, I want lots of people contributing, but I actually also am now more protective of it in this way where <laughs> I kind of, I want to make it easy for people to make their own versions and do what they want to it and also have a kind of my own vision that I don't have to explain all the time. It must be must be amazing to 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 have developed something like that and see other people do mind blowing stuff on it. You know that you that you would never do yourself. Have you have you seen other people do? Um, did other people blow your mind with it already? Have you have you seen things happen which you thought were amazing? Yeah, people. So many people blow my mind with it a little bit. We had our second <laughs> Hydra meetup a few weeks ago, and there was a show and tell. And almost every person who presented something like had made an entire library or performance or something that they had spent lots of time doing. And these are people I had never met before. And just to actually watch, I don't know, like a, an online radio station with generative visuals or uh, um, I can't, I'm like blanking on examples right now, but every every person who talked, I was like, wow, and you did this? I know this. So. It, that that I think, to me, is really exciting. exciting. Cool. Question for William from Otto Watt. What's up, Otto Watt? <laughs> uh, which language platform tool did you use to create Fields OS? What is it? Um, well, obviously the controller part is uh, on Lemur, but um, yeah, maybe you can explain. Yeah, so it's uh, Lemur is my controller, um, and then and Reaper is the thing that's generating all the sound, as I explained. Um, but in the middle is um, a JavaScript layer um, that's run is actually running in Chromium, like basically the browser, um, and it's basically for kind of state management, so I can kind of save the, the state of the system and recall it later. Um, I, and I can use it to generate new states of the system, essentially. Um, and what, what's really cool is that you know, the, the state of the system is basically like the position of all the sliders. You know, it, and I'm saving it as a big array of values between zero and one. Um, and what's, what's cool about that is that it's, you know, once you have that, uh, it, you can do interesting things um, just by using simple math. So, for example, you could take uh, one kind of snapshot or state of the system and another one and uh, interpolate between them. So you could slowly like morph one track into another one. Or you can take two and uh, take some of the traits or some of the parameters from from one and some from the other one and make like a child that that kind of reflects a little bit of one parent and a little bit of the other parent. So because one of the Fields OS uh, episodes is called breeding music, uh, where I basically I play one uh, kind of snapshot first uh, as one parent and then a few like 30 seconds of the second parent and then 30 seconds of the child. And if you listen closely, you can hear in the child, wow. you can hear aspects of both parents, you know? So you could do these kind of like really interesting things once it's all stored as just, just data, you know, in the system. DNA. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. It makes it uh, really powerful once you, you, you know, you're kind of working with just math, you know? Awesome. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I Actually, was, I have a uh, question for Olivia. Oh, um, sure. Go. Because I, I saw recently you had um, you posted some stuff where it looked like Hydro is turning into kind of a paint program or something. So, what, what is that? Like, what's happening there? And what, like, where are you? you know, what do you? Where are you headed with that? I never know where I'm <laughs> headed, but I made. Um, 
But I started making a sort of editor. It happens a lot with Hydra where you can only position things with code, but actually I really want to drag them around. And so I made sort of, I started making sort of a hy hybrid editor where I can move something on the screen um, and that changes the code or I can change the code and it changes what I move on the screen. Um, but yeah, I also then want to combine this with something I was doing about a month ago that was like, I was calling it Fubbles, but it was using drawings to control kind of sequences of parameters in time. So you could just make a drawing and that's a series of X positions and a series of Y positions. And, and um, someone on the internet started using it with sound synthesizers, but I'm too much of a beginner with sound to do that yet. But, um, but anyways, I wanna combine this with this sort of um, visual code editor of where I can like drag things and have this action um, repeat itself, but then also take that sequence and being able to use code to transform that sequence that I just did kind of gesturally. Um, and so, yeah, I'm getting more into this, a just kind of really hybrid interfaces of being able to do things um, by dragging things or by writing code for it and have it be kind of like transferable between the two things. What did you call that? You had a funny name for that. The, the drawing one was called Fubbles, like Fubbles <laughs> or something. And I, it's something, I think it's similar to how a lot of like audio iPad apps work sometimes where you can like move your fingers and it records that motion like sampler or something like this. As, um, but uh, I guess I was just adding it to my own editor and also kind of recording these movements. Yeah, I love that. I love that. How are you doing the sound part? Is that some JavaScript library or something? Or? No, I don't. I, I've experimented with like this last like two years, I've been trying to learn about sound, but I, I have trouble with using existing things. And there's so many to, things to choose from, basically. But yeah. I've, I've gone from just, oh, sound is just numbers coming out of the computer. Let me just throw numbers <laughs> out of my computer at 44,000 times a second and see what it sounds like. Like, so I've gone from that direction to like doing some DSP. So there's, I don't know, there's no sound. Olivia. <laughs> the sound is only for me right now. <laughs> are you, are you um, have you ever heard of um, Metasynth, Olivia? Is that, um, it, it basically it deals with it deals with sound um, uh, through visuals. I mean, it's uh, it's like a, a, I don't I don't know if it's even still around, but I used to use it um, years ago. It's, and oh, it's still and cool. Cool thing is, is it still? Does it still exist, Richard? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, have it on I, I should get back here. into that because oh, it's nice, great. nice. I still because use it's, it all um, the time. Yeah, I mean, it's not real time, sort of. I mean, it wasn't back then, but it, it basically, um, your sound is represented by, you know, like a, a picture, you know, or uh, an image and, and by uh, sort of overlaying patterns or just cutting things out sort of, um, or ch changing the, the balance or the colors or whatever. Um, it sort of um, manipulates the sound uh, through uh, working on the visuals. It might actually be a nice, way to have some you know at some point have a real-time version of that that would be interesting you can yeah, draw stuff in real time with it if you use the pen tool and as it plays across in medicine yeah you can change colors and use intensities and do change the uh spray type so it's like you can paint in particles or vector based lines mm. you can actually do a lot of stuff with the new version or the latest version of Metasynth, and it's based on additive synthesis, so using mm. sine wave partials and stuff like that. Um, so you can change. I think it's square and sine waves are the only two choices you have. But you have um, you can do some pretty powerful things with it. Like Yoakum said, you can import an image of like say like a cat or something. You can <laughs> invert it or flip the colors, and then the colors will mean different frequencies are played the you know the brighter the intensity the higher in pitch things are go the darker the the lower in tone the mm. pitches but there's a and you could do some really uh, you could just do some really strange stuff with it i like taking stuff and they have special tools where you could do it's like photoshop so you could like yeah. select an area 
you can you can multiply that patterning of the image out so you create like these staggering squares and that sounds really interesting or it could be like circular shape or triangles or it could be some abstract object that you carve around and then you could you could copy and paste that or you could blur stuff too that's really interesting mm. i like doing really sharp like vectorized patterns mixed with super blurred meshy it sounds like it's like spectral like FFT smearing in a way but it's a it's still a really fast there's another one called photo photosynthesis i think it's photos it's a windows app that does a very similar thing to medicine um and you can also import images you don't have as many editing tools to create your own like uh sort of audio visual compositions but it's 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 still extremely powerful even to this day i still use medicine for creating like really trinkly beautiful synthetic um detailed sounds there's just something about it, it has a very silky beautiful yeah quality gla a, a bit of a glassy a glassy sound yeah yeah very glassy really beautiful. Yeah. i don't know anything else that sounds like it that's why i still no. keep using it because i don't have yeah. nothing else made <laughs> stuff yeah, like I that it's still running on my old machine. Maybe you should uh, have another go because I, I used to use it a lot, actually. Yeah, it's really yeah, it's still fascinating even yeah, to me. But I mean, that, that's on. that's one of the, I think, a good example of um, how you know how you can work with sound in a, in a visual um, you know um, medium, basically. I don't think there's yeah, like you said, there's maybe this one other Windows app, but. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's cool. Is it similar to Virtual ANS or something? Oh, Virtual ANS is great too for iOS. I was just playing with yeah. that the other night. <laughs> <laughs> I um, like um, my very first time I learned about sound. I was like, oh, I just <laughs> put as many oscillators no. as I can on the screen and have the pixel control them. And I put it online, and it's called Pixel Synth, but it's like a very bad, like. Um, version of these things, but then, um, then that's how I learned about all these things. Is like, oh, I put this experiment online, but I still get emails of people who are like, oh, I listened to a picture of my cat now. <laughs> <laughs> like, look what my cat sounds. <laughs> yeah, Alexander, um, the developer, he's amazing. He's a lot. He's, he's he made Sunbox too, right? The Sunbox mm -hmm, app for iOS. Yeah. I use Sunbox a lot too. He makes dude, he's he's ripping it when it comes to like really innovative, interesting iOS um, apps for just music creation or sound design. But yeah, virtual ANS is awesome. Uh, I've actually seen the real instrument in Russia when I was in Moscow. So I saw the the real. I took my picture next to it. Me and my friend Rob, we went. Um, like, so I played a festival in Moscow, and we were had the chance to go see it in this. Mu it's a, it's like a, it's a. I forget the name of the museum, but it's it's a museum just of musical instruments um, from Russia. So it's it's housed there. So we went upstairs and had our photos taken with it. I actually tried to get inside it to look inside, and one of the security people was like, "Hey, get out of there!" <laughs> I was like, just so fascinated with this machine. <laughs> So there was a hardware synthesizer that like worked in the spectral domain like that. Yes, that's insane. Yeah, yeah they have. Um, I think Coil, one of my favorite bands that uh, I grew up listening to, they made an album using this this system, this actual instrument. But yeah, um, yeah, it's wow. fascinating. It's really fascinating. A lot of a lot of this technology stuff. I, I think that oh this is like fresh and something new but oh then I'd like do that I'd look back in history and I'm like oh this has actually been done before <laughs> I'm always surprised thinking that you know it's, uh, it's it's now that computers and tablets and stuff are so are powerful enough to do this processing and you know such in the in the palm of our hands we kind of take it yeah. for granted I guess all the amazing things that we have available to us now that used to be really really hard to do back then. But um, yeah, it's fascinating. I really find all that um, really interesting. I'm such a nerd for anything and any of that stuff. So, do you have you ever <laughs> seen the the Axel Richard? That's the that's like a uh, some kind of wavetable synth where you could draw. It has sort of this matrix hardware matrix thing with. Oh, uh, I've, you can draw I've seen your own waveforms. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine I've actually never has seen one. one. In person. Yeah, it's like a the, sort of the 
forerunner of, of um, wavetable synthesis, uh, but you know you can control the waves manually, you're just drawing on a very low resolution sort of pixelated square. You know and you can draw your waveforms. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you, like you said, how easy it, it is these days to to do this kind of stuff, and it sort of took like this massive machine. <laughs> yeah, what, in the past, what, yeah. have, like, or <laughs> the clunky interface. In <laughs> you buy for fifty bucks on your computer. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's really amazing. Yeah, I've, I'm always blown away by yeah me coming up. I know with Yoakum, we came up using hardware sequencers and analog equipment when I first started making music, and then when I started to get into computers, a lot more. I started to discover a lot of these more sophisticated processes and things that you could do to sound. And there's still what? something about restriction, though, man. Uh, yeah, you know, being having having something that is just has a very very limited range of possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. I I still totally believe and and enjoy um, using very sort of limited gear. You know, just to I don't know, just makes makes you work harder. And and um, <laughs> I don't know if that's the thing though. But I mean, it um, it sometimes is good to be limited and not sort of um, drown in the endless sea of possibilities. I think people who start making music these days. They have incredibly powerful tools um, to their disposal, but are also, you know, uh, exposed to so many things that it can be very daunting uh, to even, you know, find your own way of working or to even get something uh, done. You know, it's, it's it's very easy to just keep postponing your decisions and and just. Uh, um, end up doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm a big proponent of kind of developing your own instrument, you know, mm. and like setting your own constraints or, you know, like, for example, I've, um, I used lemur as my controller. So this, and I'm using a kind of a small iPad for it. So, you know, I try to limit it to a certain number of tabs, right? So to keep it as, it's kind of a trade-off between simplicity and and speed and 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 how intuitive it can be uh, versus how expressive it can be, you know. And I think there's a, there's something to be said for kind of refining and developing your own instrument that you can get good at, you know, where you can develop muscle memory for it, so that you can do, you can make things happen without really even thinking about them. You it's know, true what? for it's true for any any instrument really i mean whether yeah. it's like a classical you know guitar or piano um i mean it takes it takes hours to or hours or days or years to get fluent fluent on on a, on a uh, a classical instrument but it it's all, it also makes sense to uh have the same approach on uh whatever uh you know electronic gear you're using you know the the, the more fluent you are on something the the better yeah. and it takes time <clears throat> yeah i think yeah because like if you open up a like a blank max win you know max msp window or just a blank you know DAW project or something that it's overwhelming because there's so many plugins you could choose there's so many things you could do but if you just have you know if you develop an instrument you just you can just sit down and play you know and work within whatever constraints you have and it ends up uh, helping you to kind of develop your own voice too, your own mm -hmm. sound, yeah. because it, it's the sound of the constraints that you've chosen, you know, and that you're working with. I think I call it option anxiety, yeah. where you just, <laughs> you know, like Joachim said, you, uh, I'm definitely guilty of that. I have set, I have pretty almost everything at my disposal, and like I'll come into my room sometimes or look at my, you know, my computer. Where I have like five thousand plugins, and I'll sit there for ten <laughs> minutes and be like. I don't even know what to use. Um, so it's but Richard, it when, when you when when you do a, a patch, do you make a patch for one occasion, or do you live with it for a while and see what the range is of the of the, of the patch to sort of fully explore? It's just to learn, sort of basically learn your instrument. Is that something you do, or or is Definitely. it just rip it out, rip it out in in the night and start fresh again, or how, how uh, do you? I'd say it's a combination that? of all the above. Um, right. Okay. Most <laughs> most recently, um, it's funny that we're talking about this because most recently I, I did this exercise with this new record that I'm going to be releasing November 11th. It's a it's like an abstract acid record. Yeah, and I got that. Oh, cool! It's crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah it's great. <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the first track, the um, the one that starts out as a sort of um, 
uh, it's obviously an acid track, but then it, at some point it gets all choppy and crazy and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's cr yeah, very Richard. So it's, exactly, yeah, it's very, yeah. this record was made with very minimal gear. I used like two TB303s, just two effects pedals, a TR8 S drum machine, and a, like a 7U um, modular system. So it's pretty small, you know, suitcase um, set of modules. So it wasn't really a lot of gear compared to what I could have used. And a live setup, concept, basically. Basically a live setup, yeah. yeah. So all the record was was just a 45-minute, 46-minute recording of, of a new live set. And it was actually an hour, but to get it to fit on the vinyl, I had to really cut stuff down. Um, so I basically recorded like a 46 minute version of a one hour set and then kind of condensed it and uh, cut it to make it work for vinyl. But yeah, I wanted to also restrict and limit all the tools that I would, you know, take into the process of making this record. So I didn't want to, you know, use my huge modular system. It's like, I'm only going to use what I could take on an airplane with me if I'm going to play this out in a, you know, for a show. So that would restrict me to just using a couple of Eurorack samplers, two Eurorack sequencers, and just a couple of effects and everything I had right there had to be done. Like I was like, all right, if I had to do just an, the record with just these set of tools, I'm gonna program these things out to the max and see what happens. Um, and that's why the tracks have this MS like DJ mix sort of feel because I had everything kind of pre-programmed and I just kind of like morphed and tweaked and played everything live and just whenever it felt natural to move to the next progression is when I kind of made things happen. And um, yeah, so it was a very different way of making a record than I did previously with my previous album, which was like chaining these modular systems together and each system was going to do each part within the track. And um, so I know when people were looking at the track times, they're like, what, 13 minutes, 19 minutes? This is crazy. Mm -hmm. What? What's going so on with they, these tracks? <laughs> are they actual live takes then? So there, there's no editing. Yep. Okay. No cool. editing. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, wow, so it's a, it's a yeah. I spent a lot of time first getting the mix right, getting all the samples and everything right. So when I played through it, I wanted it to sound as perfect as I could get it, or as close as perfect. There's definitely some parts in it where, um, I didn't, I wasn't too happy. Like there were sections, I was like, oh, that effect was a little bit loud or mm -hmm. something, but it was live. I had just recorded mm -hmm. it live in one take and then I just went back. It's like, kind of like William said, like, I kind of just said, hey, you know, I it recorded is this. It is. And yeah. it is what it is. It's a live set. It's a studio live set. And um, I, I love the rawness of that. Yeah, it, it comes across. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It, I I wanted it to be that way. I didn't want it to be crazy too polished. I mean, it's still polished in a way, the way I mastered it and everything. But still, it's like, you know, if you were to go hear me play live. I mean, it was my live set that I was going to play this year. That because of COVID, when everything got shut down, I was like, all right, well, I don't know if this. I don't know when I'll ever play this stuff out. <laughs> and so, why not release it and let people at least get to hear it? And that was the whole idea behind it. And so far i've gotten pretty positive uh feedback from it and uh, i just wanted to try making acid music i've been made acid music in like 25 years i think when i first started making acid music it was yeah probably back in my high school days when i first got my 303 when i was 18 i still have the 303 i ha i bought when i was 18 years old i still have it so i used it on this record still have it and it still works and um yeah i don't know how it, maybe people would be to hear acid at this time, but I just, for some reason, wanted to hear acid go back and revisit that sound this year for whatever reason. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Something um, about it reminds me of, do, do you know that this album, um, themes from vapor space? Do you know? Oh, no. yes. I, yeah. something, something about it reminds me of that. It's like this extended thing that just like, it's this continuous like adventure through. I mean, it, it's it's very like analog and tweaky, and there's something totally. about that, the, your album that reminds me of that. It's a great. Oh, that's great awesome. Uh, oh, thank you. Classic, yeah, classic. I, classic. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that album too as well. So that's that's awesome. That it, it makes you think of that. You reference that. Yeah, because I yeah I'm pulling things from the past. A lot of it is just music I grew up listening to. A lot of early Reflex, Aphex Twins, early Acid stuff, Mike Dredd, to to whatever my brain's at right now. So it's like this weird mixture of like stuff from the past and stuff from the present. And yeah, I don't even know what to call it. Like 
that's I say it, I say abstract acid, but then there's parts of the tracks in the set where it's like not acid at all. It's just this weird jumbling of stuff going on where it just kind of happened in real time. I was like, okay, this is this is int- I don't even know what to call this, but <laughs> that's the best. I'm just let it, I just let it go and uh, I'm recording, so it's just gonna whatever people interpret it as being, it's they can interpret it being that. So you know, that's kind of the fun part of when you get something going like that but yeah so that was um an exercise in limit you know limiting my tools and and trying to push the limits of what i could do just with those few pieces of gear um and i found that that was actually a really fun way to work and i feel like enforcing limitations on myself actually forces me to be more creative i feel like i don't work well when I have to try to figure out how to use all this stuff at one time or, you know, I'm not, I've realized that I'm not one of those people. I'm definitely a person that likes to work more intimately with a smaller set of tools and a system that I feel more comfortable with rather than, you know, trying to use, you know, huge amounts of stuff. I'm just not one of those people. I know people look at my students really, like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> using this huge modular that's got all these blinking lights. But what they don't realize is I've got like four patches that are all running at the same time, but you're only hearing one patch <laughs> out of all those patches and all the other ones are just muted. So I use a lot of my stuff in sections. I work in things at different times. Sometimes I get bored on one patch. I'll be like, all right, this one's not really doing it for me tonight. So I'll just, I'll just mute it and work on this other patch that's in the case right next to it. And then it just kind of I can just hop around based on emotionally how I feel on any given night. So it's, you know, it looks a lot crazier than it really is. It's, it's, yeah, it's not, it, it looks it, totally indim- intimidating, man. If you, yeah, <laughs> everyone comes into my room and I'm like, oh, no, that's just this patch and then this one. And it, and it makes more sense when you're here. But when you see it, I know when people see my stuff online, they're just like, what is even going on in that guy's yeah. place, man? It's just ridiculous, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of uh, reassuring <laughs> that um, yeah. you know such a coloss- colossal patch is uh, <laughs> is even uh, too much for you to uh, to keep uh, keep your head around. I mean, it makes sense, you know, if you have so many if you have so many panels, you know, to just start um, uh, separating patches. You know, one doing percussion, one doing sort of you know f- sort of floaty stuff, and the other one doing something else. And then at some point, you can still combine them, but they were you know, having sort of separate things going on so you can still keep, keep your head around the system. Makes sense. It's probably the yeah, only it's way just, to do it. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's just different sketches yeah. and ideas. I know not everyone works that way. I know I have friends that work mm. on really, really big systems that can, they can work that way. For me, I, I don't feel as connected to the instrument because I don't feel like I fully, fully utilize all of the, com- you know, the complexity and really like m- muscle out all the, the power that I can get out of each one of the modules. But if I have a more focused smaller system where I curate everything that goes in that system and then I just study that it's easier for me to digest that and absorb that and then work with that and I find the strengths and weaknesses of each one of those modules much quicker than if it was in a much bigger system where I just kind of reach for stuff and not really think think about much about what I'm doing you know so um I, I like I said I like to digest things in smaller packages, so I, I'll usually put stuff in a smaller case and just study those for several weeks or patch with that for a month or two, and then yeah, then patch out from there if I want to get more from that. But I feel that's a much better approach than trying to yeah, it makes sense sure. <laughs> take it all at once, yeah. which for me never really works out. But but it could be like that in the computer too. I've worked on patches where I made stuff in Reactor. Or, uh, Max or whatever, and you know, I've I've got tons of ensembles I've created where I've created these mon- monstrosity synths and stuff, and um, or these reactor block synths that were you know where they've gotten so big, I'm like pushing my CPU at eighty percent, and I've got all this stuff going on, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, what what am I trying to achieve here? Like, let, let me go back to the root of the problem. I like I'm trying to make music, but I want to make something that's interesting. I didn't have to make this huge thing to, you know. To, to make this sound, I could have done this with much a much simpler set of tools, and it'd be just as effective. So it's, yeah, I guess it's most. Imp- we just never lose sight of what the most important thing is. Like j- at the end of the day, what you record and what people get to hear is like really the most important thing. So it's like whatever you have to use to get to that point. It, you know, it doesn't have to be overly complicated or the most expensive thing or the biggest thing. It could be the most simplest <laughs> instrument, you know, to get that point across. 
Corinthians seven four one. Nice name. A nice avatar. <laughs> yeah. What's up? Um, yeah. Question. You, you can keep talking, Richard. It's a. Uh, it's a question about um, how did you sequence the latest album with Limited Seven U? Is it? Yeah. I, I assume this is about the Acid album. The right? Acid album. Yeah. Um, I guess. Yeah. It's. Uh, that's a good question. It was a combination of using the TR8S Roland drum machine. I programmed a lot of the patterns, bass, like the kick drum patterns in that. I had some of my own samples. Then I synced that with the MST from uh, Matson Modular, which does MIDI time clock to uh, control voltage and to gate. So that was clocking two other sequencers that I multiplied out, um, the winter modular, uh, sequencer and the circadian rhythms tip top sequencer which were both running at the same time and they were sequencing the er301 and two bit boxes and a bunch of other stuff so it was kind of like a, a i want to say it was a combination of all three of those um sequencers and yeah that was pretty fun and, and, and a clock divider too i was using the qcd 4ms clock divider multiplier so i can multiply and divide the uh clock signals um for some of the other stuff and uh, i think that was pretty much it it wasn't that much stuff yeah and when you can hear it it's not an overly it's more of like a dancey record for me i feel like where the kick drums you kind of can follow where the kick drums are at. it's not like completely all over the place and i'm using like stochastic probability based removal <laughs> adding stuff like i did on my last record but this one's i tried to kind of have it be more of a I was hoping it'd be more like of a dance, my version of like a dance record, so to speak. So, did, did you do multiple takes, or how many takes did you do for this? Um, for this one, I think it, I, I did it like in five or six takes. It was, you know, I got everything set up, mm -hmm. and then I think by the fifth or sixth take, I had it perfect. And I was like, all right, I can run through the whole thing and and do a multi-track recording of it, you know. And sometimes I, I do really funny things. Sometimes I stick sheets of paper out where like certain part in a track, I'm like, okay, this is where things are gonna get really bright, turn the filters up, blast off, and then I'll draw some stuff. And then I'm very like diagram, picture, picture based, especially when I don't work to a, when not working to a computer screen, I'd like to like have like little drawings and things that reference like certain things that I wanna have happen at like maybe eight minutes or something. And then I have like my phone running on a timer you know, it's all like <laughs> countdown. Even when I play live, it's it's something that I've had to do when I've done my modular sets because, the like I said with like tidal cycles in the modular, the clock's always running. So you're you basically you start you start but you have to, you kind of have to figure out. I'm always have to be conscious of the time. So I'm like, all right, I have an hour. Okay, I have to figure out how I'm going to fit all this in in one hour. But I have to do it all by hand. So I'm constantly looking at the clock. I'm like, all right. I gotta start moving into this part. I gotta start shifting and morphing into this section. Doesn't you know, it make you feel I, rushed though? I mean, I I, I play live um, quite a bit, but I I always just just go with the flow, see where I end up, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I I I often think, oh, sh I should have done this or I skipped this or whatever. I, but I don't care, you know. As long as the the moment is is make ex makes sense to me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that time flows differently when you're performing, though, right? Like, cause you, oh, you can, totally. Like, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> like you, you, when you listen back later, you're like, oh, man, like I, I stayed on that thing for a long time. Like I didn't realize because it just sounds so good in the moment and you're just like going with it. But then I've been it seems like you have to like times. consciously, yeah, you have to consciously like go fast because like in the mind of the listener it's different right it's, it's different yeah than when you're making yeah. it because i've i run a, i've run into that exact problem like especially with modular yeah. stuff you could be think oh man this is amazing you know i've been <laughs> rocking this thing you think you've been playing for four minutes but people have been like dude you've been playing for four that same part for 40 minutes can we just like get on to the next part you know and you don't even realize it because you're just all caught up in the process you know so i've exactly. i've made that mistake so many times with the modular stuff that's why i started using my phone and you know then having a sh I have an outline sheet a lot of people see like when I play live I have these outlines printed of a sheet of paper that'll be like all right I'm going to start at this BPM and I just have some notes like maybe I'll set like the root note of what scale I'll play in but like from there I'll kind of just improvise from there it's kind of similar mm -hmm. how you work William like I have I these templates forward. yeah I could set like uh, uh, any key I want or any way that I want to sequence 
um, the, the oscillators and the rhythms can also change. I could do things that like, you know, drum and bass tempos, or I could do stuff at half tempos. I could switch thing on the fly, but I have mm. all of the sequencer data that I can manipulate right immediately. Um, and then I can jumble around and, you know, uh, mess around with that stuff where I could add more complexity or take away things to where everything's almost barely playing. Um, so it's like you can improvise, but also get lost in it if you're not paying attention. I find, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I find that um, if you th if you put um, some thought into designing your performance instrument, you know, if I'm, I'm talking about the hardware now, right? Like uh, your acid uh, hardware setup. Um, <laughs> You know, the key for me is to keep it simple enough to have uh, to easily keep your head around it and, and uh, to to in order to be very uh, uh, to be very intuitive with it in a sense. And on the other hand, have enough parameters so you can f you can have a, a broad enough range to to sort of visit all the uh, extreme corners of whatever the machine is capable of. I call it a machine, but it's, you know, a setup basically. So and, and once you uh, find that balance right um, yeah you can basically just rely on your intuition and um, just go with the flow without um, sort of end up in territories where you weren't ex expecting you know you don't have to you, do, you don't need sort of recall or, or rescue buttons or you know uh, things to fall back on but you can just keep on improvising and sort of uh, explore you know the range and the territories you, it can it can take you to um uh, and and still you know have a different show every time you know what i mean um so yeah what, simple what, enough Joachim, what are you using these days for live oh it depends i mean um i've been doing uh quite a bit of uh live collaboration so there would be also be always be another person involved and um uh it is basically all improv you know so um you put your gear together you sort of explore the range of what is what the combination of gear um, is capable of doing and then um, at some point when you think okay got my head around it just press start and see where we see where see where it goes but it can be very simple stuff like um, you know just uh, step sequencers um, drum machines um, some some things to manipulate the sound with some you know tabletop filters or effect boxes and um, I usually build chains of stuff so you know one sound source and then have like multiple sound modifiers uh, before it reaches the mixer and then uh, you know you know if you have like a couple of chains of, of, of that you know just a bunch of sources and a bunch of um, modifiers um, you know the vocabulary or the range of stuff can be can be quite huge but still you have a very uh, you have your head around each chain so you ha you know kind of you kind of know the range and you know where it's what is what territory you can cover with it so it's very controllable and very intuitive and you don't really have to think about it too much you know yeah. so it's um, yeah that's that's the way I approach it it's um, simple enough but with a large range um, you know with as um, um, as much um yeah a, pro a, lo a lot of range but still not as much that you can completely lose the lose track of what you're doing or yeah. sort of end up in um areas where you are like scratching your head you know <laughs> <laughs> how do i get out of here <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i mean uh, yeah it makes sense i mean uh, you've you've uh, basically uh built in rescue uh Sort of going back to preset uh, states, right? In your in your field OS. Yeah, um, I can always. Return. Yeah, I can always load another kind of snapshot, or uh, you know, kind of reset to the um, you know the original state, um, or like reinitialize the whole system. Yeah, but I've had that experience in the past with because years ago, my, like the kind of the first version of Fields OS was written in PD. Um, for around 2000 or something like that. And um, there were times where I would perform and I would just get totally lost. Like this, just like chaos would happen. I wouldn't know like what was happening. <laughs> I wouldn't really know how to fix it. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's good to have like um, some sort of like reset button to like come back to reality or to, mm -hmm. so you're not like 
you don't get completely lost. Um, it's, it's a bit scary when you're on stage in front of a bunch of people and <laughs> you don't know what's happening, you know. Um, but that's what makes it exciting too, you know. It's uh, it, I think it makes it more interesting for the audience too. It's like when you're using uh, generative stuff, random stuff, and you're improvising and you know, you don't know what's about to happen and you, know, you push a button and something happens and you have to deal with it. And you have to, to kind of sculpt it and find a way to make it musical. Sure, and, it's got to be really, dangerous. It, yeah, yeah. It's got, there has to be some kind of danger going on. Otherwise yeah. it's just boring, yeah. Right, it makes it exciting, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, rather than just some like pre-scripted thing, you know. Mm. So how I does it work for you? Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, Olivia, how does it work for you? Because live coding, uh, I mean, I, I've seen some people live code and I've seen some of your work, but what I'm always asking myself is, are you keep, is the process keep stacking things and keep adding things to the code or can you also just uh, um, sort of delete certain things while you are coding and, and it, the whole thing will keep running? But um, so the yeah, or is it just a, cum a cumulate a cumulative process? So you just keep on going, 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 and adding um, more code. I guess like there's it can be depending on the language. It can be like some some things like when people are live coding shaders or something. It's always evaluating everything on the page. So then each thing you edit will immediately. Um, be evaluated, but then the way kind of title or Hydra works is like you execute certain lines when you want to. So you can have lots of pages of code uh -huh. already. You could have like it's the equivalent of lots of patches, maybe the equivalent, I don't know. Lots of patches ready that you're sort of switching between. And um, okay. yeah, it definitely happened to me where because I have so much, like for a while I was just writing new things each night or like new patches or something. And then, um, Sometimes some of my first performances, I just have these like, like twenty files of code and completely got lost or something. And the that that was a lot towards the beginning. And now I tend to just build on a few ideas that I really want to explore um, live. But definitely with these things, especially I think because I, I made this thing, I also know how easy it potentially is for it to break. And so the first time other people were using it in like larger performances, I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Like, <laughs> But now I've used it, you know, in a huge planetarium and, and stuff like this. But um, yeah, also one thing um, personally in an audience, I get kind of most excited in these tense moments when things might break or something, um, especially Last year, I, I went to this uh, uh, like live AV set kind of genre of things. And um, I think the particular one I was at, which I won't go, but it was um, like, I couldn't even see the performer and there were these visuals and this sound that sounded really great, but I couldn't see any person or any um, thing happening. And I wasn't, I, I, and some people, I think, who were there really liked it. But for me, it felt like kind of being at an IMAX performance or something until the computer crashed. And, and it was actually so exciting. I was like, oh, the computer crashed. That's, that's great. <laughs> there's a real computer and there's a real something happening live. It's not just someone pressing play on something. And I know there's some um, earlier live coding performances, I think the hub, or no, actually, I'm not sure who did this, but some people who live code until their computer crashes, um, which is also fun. So when you perform, you would like to be, um, you know, as visible for the audience, so people mm -hmm. kind of see that you are uh, actually performing something. I, I think it's one of the things I like about live coding is the process of seeing what someone's yeah. doing. Um, but lately, I also, I almost enjoy more sometimes just using kind of knobs and setting things up ahead of time. And sometimes the code can be distracting. So I like I how sometimes with these live, uh, live coding uh, visual uh, performances, the sort of the, the code on the screen is actually becoming part of the the visual visual so like having feedback going on and sort of um, how, how do you st how are you able to still read it when when 
when that happens? Oh, yeah. Sometimes I can't read it anymore and I can't find <laughs> my mouth anymore. And then I just I feel very lost, but that also makes it more fun. And mm. it's like, I saw but, this yeah, question. I definitely lost, lose my mouth a lot because there's so I saw this question from Ian McCarthy. Are you synesthetic? Um, I think I always see visual things when I hear sound, but yeah. I don't know if that makes me synthesize. Or, and I like can only think about sound in a visual way, but I don't know. Yeah, if me that too. <laughs> I get when I hear a sound, I can I can sort of uh, picture what it looks like, and it it'll always be the same. So when I hear that sound again, it'll look the same again. You know, uh, I don't really use it in my process though but i yeah it's every sound has sort of like a a texture or you know um a shape but i don't know if that's um normal or or even if it's if it's real synesthetic i don't know <laughs> and another question from jonathan torrell torrell william and olivia how many voices or elements in your programming you consider is way too much <laughs> Hmm. I mean, for my system, it's it's fairly minimal. I have um, four drum voices. So there's like a bass drum, hi-hat, snare, and kind of a, like percussion uh, voice. Uh, there's a bass, uh, mono bass. Uh, there's um, kind of, and, and there's like two synths. And that that's pretty much it. Um, so I don't know how much is too much, but I think there's definitely value in keeping it simple. I think if I got rid of any of those, it wouldn't be enough, you know, because like the one of this, you know, of course you need the, the drums, you need the, the bass. And one of the, the, the synth elements is kind of more playing a melody and the other is more doing chords. So I've, I feel like I can't really take away anything else without losing something essential you know but i don't think i f i feel like i don't really need anything else in addition so it's kind of like finding the sweet spot i think mm -hmm. you know do you have the idea that you have um uh, uh i mean you're using only this this instrument this this environment right for for all your writing and all your production uh, do, yeah. do, do, you, do you ever have the the urge to get um another piece of kit or um, <laughs> have, a, have a different thing, you know, just to play around with, because you know it obviously so well, you've designed the, th the whole system and also this is your only sort of sound source and performance environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how, I, yeah, do, you, I, I, do you ever get bored? <laughs> not yet. Not okay. Yet. Um, I mean, I do fantasize about it occasionally. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I do think about I, I bitwig looks really appealing to me um especially this grid feature that it has i mean it looks that looks like something i would really like to play around with um i don't know i'm definitely a kind of a minimalist and a software person like i don't have anything on my desk really except for like a small keyboard control midi controller and audio interface like that that's it i don't own like any synths or anything like i'm, I'm definitely a an in the box, you know, software kind of guy. Um, I don't really, to me, like the analog digital debate, like I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really hear it or it, it doesn't make that much difference to me in terms of the impact of the music, you know? Yeah, it's a tool is uh, a tool is a tool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I'm also, I don't know, I, I, I'm just kind of, it's just my nature. I'm kind of just a minimalist and uh, I don't like to spend money and it's a lot easier to just do it, you know, in, in the box. If I want, you know, 10 reverbs running at once, it's free. It's fine. Mm. I just load 10 plugins. No, I, I, th I, I, I really admire that because um, I consider um, getting, a, you know, a, a new piece of gear or uh, even trying something I haven't tried for ages as as a I, I usually see that as a source of inspiration or a starting point, you know, like, um, uh, I mean, in theory, I could do something with a very small setup for the rest of my life, you know, with one instrument or something. But uh, yeah. to, for me, it's also, um, 
you know, I, I like I like the the zone I end up in when I'm I'm getting you know getting my hands on a piece of gear that I don't know really well, you know, that I really need to explore to, um, uh, yeah, to really struggle with to to get anything out of it, you know. I, I yeah. that, that that process is is most of the time giving me something that um, that I can sort of expand on and use as a starting point. I don't know about you, but yeah, uh, I, I would I would have a very hard time just using one instrument for the for the rest of my life or for, well i i think you know this, I mean? is where, this is where the generative thing comes in i think because yeah i, I have this this infinite slot machine basically i can just keep, <laughs> i can just keep hitting you the could button. do an album every day <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah. it's, it's, it's infinite I, you know, I can just keep getting more and more new stuff and it's always surprising me this like mm. the stuff that it could do like that it comes up with that i'm like i'm not even sure how it's doing it sometimes you know so oh wow i think you know, it's some like subtle combination of like this this effect uh, within this particular setting, and that you know, it, it it ends up finding these things that I don't even know how they work. So it I, that I think creates enough novelty for me, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, I think so, sometimes I fantasize about like getting a like a Digitact or what, one of those electron devices that are just like you know. Uh, completely like self-contained you know and just like having like just that mm. and just making music on that you know but uh so far this this thing has been you know satisfying and it's it's really oh like, there we go again uh, you know. <laughs> uh, last time last time we had the same situation you know people talking about gear and richard going like okay i've got one here <laughs> Awesome. Does that work for you, like like that, like that for you too, Richard? I, if you if you get your hands on a, a piece of kit, you know, like something you you haven't tried before, um, uh, does it sort of get you going, or or could you also, in theory, just use one system for the rest of your life? I guess in your case, it's you know, it's it's much a fascination for the for the gear as well as the what comes out of it, right? Yeah, I mean, being a content producer and a sound designer I've worked with a lot of synthesizer companies making patches for their synths right so I ended up with a lot of synths just because that's what my day job was mm. um, and part of that what you were talking about when you get a new instrument you got to figure out how to you know how how to get sound out of it how to get good sound out of it that was that was always my job and that's been a really fun process for me of like discovering what this new thing can do and then, like you said, you might learn something about the instrument, and it also teaches you how to kind of, you know, manipulate something to kind of get the results that you want to give you a musical outcome. Or, you know, I, I, I love getting something that I, like you said, as something I don't understand or I don't know. And I was like, mm. how do I figure this thing out and get what I want out of it, you know? And um, that, I mean, exploration, I see it as a. I yeah, exactly. I see it as a journey or a form of exploration. Yeah, yeah. form of exploration, right? And, yeah. and and through that exploration, you come up with this. I could come sometimes come up with the best stuff I've ever come up with when I've just gotten that instrument for the first time. You um, do the best things when you have no fucking clue what you're doing. No clue, exactly. <laughs> There's no preconception yeah. about like you know why is this screen in this way or this button's doing this thing or you mm -hmm. know you just sit down and you grab something and you kind of like okay what's that knob do or you. You know and i'm very much a person that you know loves playing with new things it's something that i may not be familiar with you know and just see what happens you know mm. and usually in the first hour or two you get some really cool stuff going that you and then you're like i would have never i would have never created something like that i would have never made sounds like that just by the nature of the way that this thing is designed the environment this the list of available options that you have um, is going to force you to do things you're not going to do normally under any other circumstances. So, um, in in that regard, yes, it's it can be really cool and fascinating and and feel brand new, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, even my system, uh, my modular system that I wrote my record on, like I switch things out all the time. Where um, I think that's another appealing thing about Eurorack that's so fun for many users is that you know, your system is in this constant state of flux you never mm. have to be set on one set of modules you'd be like you know what i think i'm gonna just trade out this oscillator for something else or switch out my sequencer it's just not the right fit for me you can switch out any component of your system at any time to 
you know, address some issues that you have that's, it's, you know, whether it's, it's not working with the flow that with the way that you like to write or, you know, whatever reason you, you can change anything out. You can completely reconfigure the system at any second. So I love that, that constant changing of your environment can, at least for me, I'm always like working in different places, like maybe in my kitchen or on my back porch. Um, if I'm working on my laptop or somewhere, you know, I, I, I like the change of environment that, influences me to work differently and creates different outcomes so mm. um you know i step out multiple levels even from the gear but it's yeah i think it's important but i also like what william said you know talking about these systems that you feel really comfortable with like i i feel like i, I use the nord modular g2 a lot that's that's a synth that i've been using since 2004 i've got literally hundreds of patches i've written with it now i have two of them that I link together and use with MIDI. And um, that system to me is like still so far ahead of, ahead of its time. And the sounds and stuff I get out of just the Nord G2. I mean, I could, everyone asked me what my Desert Island synth would be. It would be that, mm. uh, that and a laptop. I could create albums of music just with that synth alone. Um, and to me, to this day, it still sounds just as cool. I have the G1, Nord G1 modular and two of the g2s and like i just love those i'm sure synths. If, i'm sure if they brought that back you know um it would be a much bigger success than it was when it came out because i don't think many people got the point of it when when it came out yeah and you could do all kinds of stuff that what william was talking about setting the you can do patch mutation where you set like the father and the mother and then it could do create variations of children mm -hmm. in between that and you, i mean some of the concepts they they had come out uh, you know, back then, 2003, 2004, I mean, it was so far ahead of its time. And I know it wasn't a huge success for, for Clavi. I think it was one of the sins that almost sank the company from what I heard. That's why they didn't, the, the idea of putting it out. So I had bothered them many times about it at trade shows and been like, hey, why don't you do a Nord Modular 3? And they're just like, no, we're not <laughs> We're too scared to try that again. Um, but I think it would, like you said, I think it would be a really good time for them to revisit that uh, at, at mm. this point in time. There's so much interest with modular synthesizers yeah. and people wanting to explore that. And I think it would be a great move for them, but it wasn't enough for me to convince them. So um, I wish they would have, though, because I think it would be really successful and it would be really fun to see what maybe the next step would have been for that platform. But it's, to me... You know, that's a synth I could easily see writing albums worth still. I feel like I haven't reached the full potential of what it could do. And, um, but yeah, that's kind of like the best of both worlds. You get like the software programming environment, but then you also have the physical hardware where you can assign all the macro knobs and the buttons and you've got like snapshots, you can create sequencers and you have like this, you know, endless array of options that you could at your fingertips and you can work in either environment, whether if you want to just work with a mouse, you can work with a mouse. And, but then you can patch things up where everything can be automated and randomized and organic. And and then you have snapshots, kind of like what one system where you could snap back to a certain state. I do that a lot in the Nord too, where I have these like regenerative sequences, but then I want to set everything back to like a certain point. I always do the, the foundational snapshot at preset one, and then I can like set through the other. Yeah. Like scenes, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So. It's yeah. really fun. Oh, yeah. Um, oh. Okay. Do you want to answer that question? I mean, I had a, another question for you, too, but um, go ahead if you, if, if, you, uh, if you want. I don't know. I don't know that I have an answer, I guess. I do have this thing happen to me, though, where I get over overwhelmed with, like, adding new features rather than learning how to use the things that I've made already. And I get like, so easily bored. I th like, like just in my own, you know, on my own computer, I have a spectral synthesizer I made for myself because I wanted to learn what it was a granular synthesizer. I've still never made a single song or sound like I have like, a, I don't know, this collage thing with drawing. I don't know, I just have a billion things and um, they all end up influencing things but um well let me ask you this i mean william just told us that um even though he built fields os himself it can still surprise him in what it can come up with do you get that with um 
Hydra as well? Like, would you do something and you get like this totally unexpected output? Yeah, completely. And I think part That's of it cool. is having it so e easy to experiment with feedback and chaotic things in Hydra that um, it's really actually hard to get the same thing out of it. And so a lot of people think of computers as like, oh, everything will be precise and I'll have lots of control. And with Hydra, I think it's kind of really hard to have that because it's um, because there's it's so easy to get, generate kind of chaotic systems. And that's also why I made it easy for people to share patches with each other online because I feel like I'm kind of a when I give workshops, I'm like, I'm kind of a beginner or intermediate at Hydra or something. And I learn from other people. Like, I don't think there's such a thing as being an expert at it or something. Um, but I've been, uh, it, it's exciting for me to hear you and Richard talk about sort of being inspired from a machine too, because I really, I, I do feel like using things, it's not just the technical function of it, but it's the whole kind of experiential like how does it look how does it feel adds to what you feel like you can kind of do with it um, uh, yeah it's like if, if you have a physical um synth in front of you 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 um uh your attitude towards the instrument changes a bit you know if it's just a bunch of sliders on a screen uh i'm not saying that is a bad thing but uh, you have a different relation with it than uh, if you have something physical. You tend to get more sort of. I mean, I, I, in my case, I get more focused and sort of develop more sort of uh, an intimate, um, yeah, relationship with it. I guess that that is the thing, you know. Um, especially if you have like uh, these sort of older vintage since you know they can do very little but they are big you know and they look impressive and, and they make you approach the sound differently because you know it sort of uh, demands a different interaction from you um and that can be very um um determining for how you what you get out of it you know the, the way the way it feels the way it looks you know makes you kind of behave in a different way you know <laughs> i don't know what it is but it is true that it demands a certain interaction from you and on a screen um i get that in you know to a lesser extent you know because it's yeah you're in one position you can see sliders and you know they they have a different um uh, graphical uh, representation but um, that's pretty much um, all it is you know you don't, you don't really feel it you don't really um, yeah I don't know do you think is that something you can relate to Richard yeah. oh Richard is frozen <laughs> I didn't see it happening sorry about that <laughs> oh there he is again <laughs> it might Everyone, Richard sounding like Kraftwerk now. <laughs> I think I think we'll just go with uh, with the next question until Richard's uh, connection has recovered. Um, for Olivia and William, do you have an equivalent to getting a new piece of gear that's sets you down the new creative path an equivalent of that okay yeah fair enough yeah for me it's kind of adding a new thing to my my what i'm currently working with um so like uh, i earlier mentioned that i added this kind of new visual editor to how i'm working where i can drag move things around on the screen and and change the code um and so to me that that feels like getting a new piece of gear because I'm like, oh, now I can move things. Yeah. I guess yeah, I think I, we're too black now too. Yeah, I think for me, it, it, with my system, it, the changes that I'm making now are be becoming smaller and smaller. You know, they're like, I feel like I'm, it, it's kind of reaching maturity. So like, I'm just making these like small EQ tweaks and and things like that. Um, so I think I, I I don't know. I kind of predict at some point I, I'll just kind of scrap it all and start again with something new. You know, um, once I've kind of reached the end of this kind of process of refinement. But I think one example for me recently is um, 
um, I started using a different tuning system. Um, so this the synth uh, the synth that I use is called Surge. It, they recently added um, support for uh, different um, tuning systems like these Scala files, S C A L A. Um, and I discovered this tuning system called Bull and Pierce that's really interesting. Um, so it's different from like the the standard, you know, twelve notes in an octave kind of uh, tuning system we have. Th this system is it's it's thirteen notes, and every it, you know in an octave you have um, you know one note or I'm sorry one octave up from a note is is twice the frequency, right? But in, in this Ball and Pierce system, uh, every 13 steps is three times the frequency. So it's, it's this different uh, tuning system that sounds strange, but it, it also works. Like it, 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 it doesn't sound that dissonant if you use it in the right way. Um, and to me, this is like kind of makes everything sound kind of strange and interesting and and, and are the fresh. interval are the intervals uh regular like the intervals in with between the notes are they the same throughout the whole scale? yeah yeah okay so yeah every third every 13 steps is uh 3x or three times the frequency and i think it's it's even steps in, right in that, in that space mm. yeah um so i had to kind of program into my system that an octave is 13 steps instead of 12, for example, and um, things like that to, to kind of make it work better in the system. But um, it really sounds interesting and strange, but it also works somehow. It doesn't sound that bad. So um, I don't know, it, it, that's something that I've changed recently that's really kind of expanded my mind and, and just sounds really neat. Cool. So then it's finished, and then you're ready to uh, to make it public. <laughs> well, no, <maybe laughs> field to us in general. Yeah, I, I talked uh, Richard. Uh, I talked to Richard about it a little bit, and, and he offered to help me. But um, I yeah. need to. Uh, I need to work on that. Yeah, it's it's such a. I describe it as kind of a Rube Goldberg machine, you know, because <laughs> it's like it's so bespoke and customized that it's it's kind of hard to install it on another computer or to, to explain to someone how to set it up even well in terms uh, of the interface it's it's uh, it's pretty straightforward i mean the the way you explain it in that one video it, it doesn't seem too intimidating to me it's all visual yeah, yeah. and it's all very very self-explanatory you know yeah um, I think it, it is it is the yeah it is the is the sort of the the layer in between and sort of hooking it up to and actually get sound out of it it, it might be a bit right. um sort of you know, uh, clunky or yeah, not every the, day. It, yeah, it's the current implementation is very like kind of homebrew, basically. Mm. But but I think it could be implemented as like an app, iOS app or something like that. And it, I think yeah. it could be really awesome. And I'd love to do that and share it with people. Um, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard to force myself to focus on that, you know, when because you know instead of making music or you know doing other projects. So, um, but I, I, I will try. <laughs> I want to make it happen. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Richard is like yes. It's <laughs> yeah. hard once you make it public. Then people, I don't know. Then people use it and then new ideas happen and then you want to add more stuff and then it's hard to change because people now depend on it and then yeah. like it's really well you could just put a little i know opens, like, i know which is uh, yeah i know what you're saying but you can just put the lid on it and just uh, just continue developing it for yourself yeah. and then maybe you know once that is be that once that becomes boring to you you can do another <laughs> version you know yeah uh, no, so I you're do. always ahead of the curve basically <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a good point. I, I just listened to an interesting podcast with the guy that created Orca. Oh, Orca. Yeah, uh, yeah it's such a cool. I haven't played with it yet, but uh, it looks really neat. And um, there's a pod, I think it's called the Future of Coding podcast he was on. And he was talking about this aspect of like having a open source or like kind of shared 
tool that other people have ideas of how they want it to work and how you like negotiate and try to figure out the best path forward. And yeah, it's like, it seems like a whole other challenge, you know, which Olivia is probably familiar with somewhat. But yeah, that's, um, that adds a whole other aspect to it. I think. Cool. Well, people, we've been almost been talking for two hours. Usually we just, um, you know, run for two hours with this one. Uh, let's maybe give uh, the people in the comments a last chance to um, ask any questions. And uh, I should also say, as always, um, if you feel your question wasn't answered and you want to hang out with us or with other knob twiddlers, we have this Discord server um, running with, I think in the meantime, about 800, 900 people who are hanging out there. Um, it's a, becoming a really nice community, all music makers and audio fanatics and stuff like that, exchanging information and um, chatting about making music. So have a look there if you want to, uh, if you want to check that out. And um, we have um, a Patreon for people who like this project and want to support us. So I encourage you to have a look there as well. And um, there was one other thing I wanted to, wanted to mention. Ah, yeah, we're we're streaming this on Twitch. So if people uh, want to check out our Twitch channel, that would be cool. Um, so let's see if there is a last thing going on. And otherwise, I'll, I'll, I can give uh, any all of you a minute to plug your latest thing or your latest release or project or whatever. Um, something you've got coming up and want to share with people. Um, Olivia, you got anything you want to plug or advertise or... <laughs> Not that I can think of, actually. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, <laughs> William, you got anything work you want to share with people? Anything you're working on? Any new releases, um, maybe? I guess I guess my uh, you could check out my Bandcamp page, uh, William WilliamFields.bandcamp.com, and uh, Fields OS is on there. So that's that's like it's um, twenty four tracks. Each track is fifty nine minutes long, so it's twenty almost twenty four hours worth of music. So you could check that out. And there's a newer thing on there which called Traction, which is more stuff that I uh, perform. Um, uh, so it's not totally generative. It's it's kind of a combination of performed and generative. Um, and then other than that, my latest release is on uh, Super Pang, which is a really cool like um, experimental electronic label. Uh, something on there called Bewilderment, which is using that that unusual uh, tuning system that I mentioned. Um, so you could check that out. But. Yeah, and I'm cool. on uh, all the social media stuff as uh, not Facebook, but Twitter and Instagram. It's uh, William Fieldsy with a Y at the end. Cool, thanks. And Richard, you um, you've got that Acid EP or LP coming out. Anything else people should know about? And when was it? When is it available? The Acid one? It's going to come out November 11th. Yeah, we started pre-orders oh, cool. on October 2nd, but yeah, the official release date will be November 11th, and. Um, yeah, so that'll be coming out. Then I have a two-hour album that'll be coming out sometime next year um, of all two new hours. material. Yeah, it's right around two hours. I don't know if I'm ready yet. I want it all to come out. I can't have decided if I should release it as two separate records or if I should just release it as one record. Um, yeah, I haven't decided yet. That's that's like know, yeah. that's like ten <laughs> sides of vinyl if you're doing vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I might split it up, but it's. Some like a lot of the newer stuff I've been working on, um, especially with title cycles and the modular and some other things that I have here. Um, some newer instruments that I've been working with with some companies that hasn't come out yet. It's been really interesting, um, and then some of the machine learning stuff that I've been kind of experimenting with as well. There's all kinds of weird things I've been getting my hands into lately, and then it's been ma making its way into my most recent tracks, but. Um, so it's created some really, really interesting stuff that I can't wait to release. I'm just trying to figure out how to package it 
because it's kind of a bit a little bit all over the place um, as far as like how I put the stuff together. So, um, but yeah, so I'm hoping next year I'll probably get that that out and probably come out on Planet Mew Records. Um, right. So, I've already um, talked with Mike about putting it out. I just have to figure out what kind of format we're going to release it in. But it's it's so far what I have already is pretty out there and definitely cool. kind of like the next chapter of Strange. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to call it, but yeah, so that should be fun. So that's your first thing that is incorporates to your title cycle adventures, basically. This newer I'll stuff, definitely yes. keep an eye on. Uh, keep an eye out for that. That's that's really cool. Definitely, yeah. Cool. It should be interesting. All right, people. Well, thanks for hanging out. Really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, where can we find Hydra? Is the last thing from uh, Great Rain Seven One Four. Um, it's at hydra.ojack.xyz. Um, I'll, I'll type it in the okay. comments too. That's a good one. Yeah. Or you can Google Hydra Life Coding. It just... Okay. Well, thanks people. I really enjoyed hanging out and, uh, well, thanks thank for you. being here tonight. Thanks Olivia. Yeah. Thanks Richard. And thanks William. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Um, see you later. Have a nice evening. Have a nice day. <laughs> All right. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.